like to introduce Melissa Clark Reynolds. Melissa became a foresight practitioner and professional director after 25 years experience as a technology entrepreneur and CEO of a number of technology companies. Melissa trained, trained as a foresight practitioner with the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto in the city of California's San Francisco Bay Area. It's part of Silicon Valley and home to the well-renowned Stanford University, which many of you have probably heard of. Um, Melissa, through there, has been part of uh, the Tehono Primary Sector Boot Camp at Stanford University twice. And this is an invitation event that bring together chief executives and those with senior governance positions in the primary sector, et cetera, exposing them to thought leaders, radical thinkers, and innovative business concepts. Um, Melissa was previously the first independent director on the Beef and Lamb New Zealand board. Uh, she's a member of MPI's Growth Partnership and Investment Advisory Panel and Deputy Chair of Radio New Zealand. Uh, she currently chairs clothing company Little Yellow Bird and is a director of the lamb company Atkins Ranch. Uh, due to logistical challenges, Melissa is unable to actually physically be with us today, so you might have noticed that you hadn't seen her um, wandering around here this morning. Um, so yeah, she. She had intended to be here, but um, what we've had to do is just resort to bringing her here via video conference. So we're all pretty used to this technology now, and um, hey, how can it be an Ag Innovation Conference if we're not going to embrace some VidCon? So um, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to, to hand over to Melissa. Thank you. The floor is yours. Hey. Great. Um, oh, well, Atamario, my tato. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, I, I had one of those things where I, I like to say yes to things, and I said yes to everything, and what I hadn't realised was that I needed to be in Napier today at the same time. So, um, so thanks so much for putting up with me in this format. I just want to check because what I've got on my screen is like two pictures of myself, which is a wee bit off-putting. I want to make sure that you can see my slides. Jason, can you see those? Great. Great. So um, I'm lovely to see you there, Andrew, and um, couldn't agree more with everything that you had to say. And I, I think if we look back at these last few years, we've really seen quite a lot of change, mostly in the context of farming. And so I want to take you through a bit of um, thinking that I'm doing at the moment. So um, Jason mentioned that I work as a foresight practitioner. Um, I'm a futurist and particularly I focus on the future of food and agriculture. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for trends before they happen and I'm looking for what are called signals. And so today we're going to run through some signals and um, look, like everybody else, probably before I trained as a futurist, I had a whole lot of what I call my reckons about the future. You know, I had an opinion on this and an opinion on that. And what's been um, probably one of the best things about the training that I did is I now know a couple of things. So one is that there are no facts in the future. So we can argue all we like about what we think is going to happen, but none of us have total certainty on that. Um, we don't really always agree on what happened in the past. So we're not going to agree on what's happening in the future. So one is that, that we, we're not going to all have the same view. And the other thing related to that, I suppose, is that um, the, the future kind of comes at us long before it becomes mainstream. And I love this quote from a guy called William Gibson, who's actually a sci-fi writer. And what he says is the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And so when I look at that, um, my job as a signal hunter is I'm looking for little kind of messages from the future that might turn up. And sometimes they turn out to be the future and sometimes they don't. And I'm gonna show you a bit about the way that that process works for me and what I'm spotting in the primary sector that I think is going to turn out to be important uh, in the future. So I don't know how many of you have seen Blade Runner. Um, I've had an adult daughter come home from Melbourne. Um, she was just so sick of being in lockdown last year and she's come home for six months. She's going back in June. And so we've watched a whole lot of movies together that we never watched before. And we were watching Blade Runner, which is one of my favorite films that I probably watched when I was roughly her age. And we got to this still and she paused the, the player and she's like, mum, and gave me one of those withering looks that young people can give their parents. 
And um, this whole film, if you haven't seen it, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, it's set in a dystopian future, you know, there's flying cars, the government is monitoring everything that you do. But when the main character needs to communicate with somebody else, he has to go and find a bell phone box. And of course, I don't think my daughter's ever used a phone box in her entire life um, and barely ever seen one either. So sometimes we get these things about the future really right, but often what we do is that we come from our own worldview. We think about what our world is like now, our world today, and then we extrapolate our existing life out into the future. And we think, gosh, that's what the future will be like, but we really can't be sure. And so um, half of my master's degree is in epidemiology. And um, I kind of joke like last year, everybody became an epidemiologist. And when I used to tell people that I studied epidemiology, they'd show me their ringworm or something. And I'd go, no, no, that's dermatology, nothing to do with me. But what it means that I do is that I watch out for particularly what are called novel zoonoses. And so part of the work that I do for a number of companies in New Zealand in the primary sector is I look for novel zoonoses and I get alerts uh, onto my phone whenever something's come up. And so in December 2019, I started getting a few alerts about a novel zoonosis in China. Of course, last year, or the 2019, I spent a lot of the year looking at signals with regards to, um, to African swine fever. Um, it had made a massive difference to New Zealand's ability to export into China. So we saw the decimation of the world pork industry in 2019. And that particularly was uh, an opportunity for the lamb sector. What we saw in 2019 was that Chinese markets in particular were willing to try novel meat, uh, which lamb was one, in a way that they hadn't before because there was such a gap left over from when pork was taken out um, and you know pig, um, pig farms had their animals culled at a great rate. And so I was keeping an eye on what might be the next African swine flu actually. But what we also know, and um, we've been looking for for about 30 years, is that we know with climate change, we're expecting to see more pandemics and more often. And there are two reasons for this. One is that as the climate changes, we open up the habitat into which um, insects that bear disease that affects us, their habitat grows. So I did a project in 1992 for the Ministry for the Environment where we said around now we would expect to see our first dengue fever cases in Nelson. And the reason that we'll see them in Nelson is that with the wind patterns changing with climate change and the change in precipitation and sunshine hours, Nelson is going to be the perfect place for dengue fever to become endemic in New Zealand. So we've known these patterns for a long time. The second thing um, that's the relationship between climate change and pandemics is that um, as animal agriculture moves further and further into rainforests around the world, and we're seeing this particularly in Indonesia and in China and in South America, what we're doing is that we're bringing mammals into contact with each other, with, which wouldn't normally be in contact with each other. And so part of why I look for these novel zoonoses is that I'm fascinated about where they're going to come from. And so with China, what we saw was that in December, we started to see a few um, bits of commentary in the mainstream press about a mysterious respiratory illness. Um, by January, the first peer reviewed medical journal article had come out um, and appeared in my inbox and it had done the genotyping, um, which had shown that it came from a bat to a pangolin to a human. Now, if, I, if you have a look at me, you can see I'm pretty white. And I had my DNA analyzed a few years ago. And basically, my lot are from Scotland. Um, if you're from Scotland, you've got a good bunch of Viking in you. I got a tiny bit of German and a tiny bit of French. And, um, and I'm about 4% Neanderthal, which is actually the most you can be. What I find really interesting here is that, um, that what we have is that um, in that DNA, my ancestors have coexisted with agricultural animals for, I don't know, about 10,000 years. 
And in that 10,000 years, we've been exposed to a lot of different animal diseases. And so we just don't catch them. You know, we, we've we coexisted. And so what we're seeing now is that as we move further into rainforests, we're bringing mammals that haven't coexisted with humans into contact with each other, and also animals that haven't coexisted with each other into contact with each other. So there is no habitat where bats, pangolins, and humans hang out. And so I have no natural DNA resistance, and neither does anybody else in, in our, you know, in our communities. Um, and so by February 7th, two things popped into my inbox. One was that one of the whistleblower doctors in China had died. And already when they put them into prison, I was pretty serious that there was something major going on. And then we saw that shipping containers um, became deeply disrupted. And you probably know any of you in the meat industry or dairy, so you'll all be affected by this at the moment as we're having real trouble with container access in New Zealand and getting enough containers to, um, to ship our products to market. And for a lot of companies, we're having to air freight meat, say, into the US or into our markets in order to get it there. But that first signal that that was going to be a problem turned up on February 7th last year. And at that point, I remember having a meeting with Kotahi, uh, who are one of my clients, and we, we had a big planning session, I think it was about the 8th of February, to work out what we were going to do over the next year to uh, make sure that there were enough containers in New Zealand. And we were already liaising with Maersk to make that happen. So this is an example where these signals start to, to come into action very quickly. Another big signal that I'd like you to have a think about was that in 2016, it was the year that humans lost the internet. And so with humans losing the internet, what I mean by that is that bot traffic is now the bulk of traffic on the internet. And so we can think about good bats and bad bots, um, good bots and bad bots. Bad bots are all the viruses, the, the DDoS attacks, all that spam you get in your inbox. But the good bots are all of the ways that our machines talk to each other. So it'll be my Fitbit talking to my scales, or it might be my you know fridge talking to something else. Um, but it's, a, it's the traffic that is generated by machine to machine and doesn't involve any humans at all. And back in kind of 2016, I started watching a few internet applications that I thought were very interesting. So at the top left here, we have a fridge magnet from a company called Tide. And Tide is the US best selling, um, what do you call it, laundry detergent. And so this fridge magnet, you can poke that white button. And if I tap that white button, a box of Tide automatically drops into my Amazon shopping cart. And of course, as a futurist, I'm going, wow, that's very interesting because we know that bots are taking over the internet. This is shopping without a website. And so immediately I start thinking, well, I remember a world before websites. What's the world going to look like after websites? And so I started looking to see where the signal might go. And in 2017, Amazon put out a fridge magnet on the right there, which is a scanner. You could scan the barcodes of what was in your fridge and it would drop it into your Amazon shopping cart. And then on the left here, what we see is um, a Samsung Amazon fridge. We're now onto the fourth generation of these fridges. They're fully integrated with Amazon. And so what happens is that the scanner it out. Um, if I don't put it back in, it drops it into my Amazon shopping cart. And when I'm asking about the future of the internet, I think that the next bit of real estate that brands will be chasing is, is right here on our fridge. And some of you um, may also be in dairy. Um, what we've seen is that um, Fonterra for a long time um, has been supplying butter into the US. But the most important and best selling brand of butter in the US is Land of Lakes. Land of Lakes is completely integrated into this fridge. And so when people run out of butter, the number one butter that is sold through the Amazon fridge is Land of Lakes butter. 
And um, about six months ago, I think it is, um, Fonterra has now done a partnership with them, um, with Land of Lakes. And what I would expect to see is that on this Amazon fridge, we'll start to see promo codes and um, promotion coming that says, will you switch to a Fonterra brand? Will you try some other kind of butter? Um, but it also is important as we think about branded meat, we'll start to see that the, the Amazon shopping cart like it just keeps buying the same brand. It doesn't go, oh, that was lamb. Here's another lamb rack. What it will do is it'll go, that was Atkins Ranch lamb rack. I'll order you another Atkins Ranch lamb rack. Um, and so we'll end up with tighter brand um, integration into Amazon. And what we'll also see is that it makes it harder for people to break out and try new products. Interestingly, in a completely parallel universe, what we saw was Whirlpool has released a fridge which runs um, an oven which runs completely off a phone. And um, it's not like I've got an oven that I can set to start later. Um, and this is more that I don't have to do any programming with this Whirlpool oven. It reads the recipe off my phone and it programs the oven itself off the recipe. And I can see a time where the oven and the fridge start talking to each other and saying, you know what, if you just like, you've got your lamb racks there, you've got a bit of asparagus. If you just ordered some potatoes and some Fonterra butter, what you could have is a really nice meal. And I can see that that, for some people, they'll think it's creepy. For me, that would be really useful to be able to have my shopping list just be integrated with my kitchen appliances. And I want you to understand here, these are signals. That means they are already in existence in the world. I'm not making any of this up as sci-fi. These are existing products. I'm just interested in where they might go next. So um, what we've also seen in terms of big changes in the last couple of years is we've seen more and more butchers go online and, um, and we're seeing that as a global thing. This is a Melbourne butcher, but I've seen the Ekatahuna butcher go online, um, Greenlee, um, people like First Light have been doing their products into the US as a direct to consumer online, but we're starting to see that they're bringing that uh, state club to New Zealand. So more and more of these offerings are going online. Amazon is able to use those bots that I talked about to be able to deliver products to people pretty much anywhere in the world very seamlessly. Um, Amazon Go stores, again, like Atkins Ranch, we're in these stores and it's been an interesting learning curve where they use technology in the store that they're, you, you have a prime app on your phone, you walk in, um, the store recognizes you because you have the application on your phone, you take what you want, you leave and it hits your phone. There is none of that kind of bogus uh, self checkout thing. I just want to tell you self checkout is not the future. I just hate those things. Um, there is no unexplained item in the bagging area in the future. Um, that there is no bagging area. You come in with your own bag, you put it in your bag, you walk out. And this is again, not the future, this is the present. And there are going to be 23 of these stores around the US within a very short period of time. And then I'm, I'm interested, I don't know where this is going to go, but I see that Amazon has just done a trial of its own cryptocurrency. So it has launched its own currency in Mexico. Uh, I assume that this is a trial that they'll think about taking out to the world. Um, I don't know where it's going to go, but it's an example of a signal that I'm keeping an eye on. And it's something that wasn't uh, around a year ago. If you had said to me a year ago that Amazon was going to launch its own digital currency, I thought, you know, I don't know if it's its core business, don't know if it makes sense, not sure. So um, I really encourage you to, <coughs> sorry, to have a think about what big changes are coming your way, um, what business models are available, what technologies there are, and what might you do to make this work for your customers. Um, I, I'm, I also encourage you to put any comments or questions into Slido and I'll, I'll pick them up as we go. So one of the big areas I'm seeing a change in is what I'm calling bundling. So you can see that with that Amazon fridge, um, it turns the fridge into the um, into a replacement for websites. There's none of that like waiting for countdown to get a delivery slot. There's none of that um, kind of, I don't, you know, all of those horrible interfaces. I haven't found a supermarket that has a great interface. What I like about the Amazon model, even though I'm I'm not that sure about Amazon at times, is that it basically it takes it off what I've already ordered and it's going to reorder that for me. 
This is my favorite butcher in the UK. Um, it's called N16. And you can see it's all full of hipsters. It doesn't really look like a butcher. Um, what it looks like is um is a bunch of people with you know wine and cheese and i went in there to buy some food for my family um my daughter-in-law had just given birth and she wanted a bit of roast beef i went in and these hipsters um with their tats and beards gave me gave me the beef gave me the herbs to cook with the beef and then said to me what are you going to drink while you're cooking and i'm like genius and so they sold me a, a bottle of Cote de Rhone and then they said, actually, you'll need two, one for dinner and one to drink while you cook. <coughs> and then on the left hand side there, you might see that they've got a cheese section. And so they also said to me, what are you going to eat while you cook? And this is what I mean by bundling. They're not thinking, oh, we're in the meat industry. They're thinking we're in the food industry. We're in a meal industry. And then they sent me across the road um, to get um, vegetables to go with it. So um, I love this idea. Somebody has asked me, is people's demand for convenience greater than people's wanting to make ethical choices? Can they coexist? I absolutely believe they can coexist. And I also think that you can set parameters around what you want to buy and how. So um, I believe that there is um, there are two futures around the ethics one. There is a lower priced, high volume transactional sector of the market, which will carry on. People will continue to buy meat on price. And then there's an ethical um, part of the market that will have a number of attributes that people want. It may be no GMO, it may be no antibiotics, and it may be regen. And, um, and they will attract a higher price. And the way I know that they will attract a higher price is because they already are in this market. Um, and you can set that. And I think it's interesting that both Amazon and Whole Foods want to be able to offer Gap, um, and particularly Gap 4 in their product base. And on top of that, uh, Whole Foods is developing their own regen standard. And so they see, in, in 2020, um, Whole Foods said that that was their biggest food trend that they um, predicted in terms of getting increased prices back to producers. So we'll come back to that. Um, I mentioned direct to consumer, you know, to me, once Ekata Huna Country Meats has got a website, everyone has. Um, I've had this question about, you know, if we're only just getting rid of checks, how long until this future of shopping is going to be the norm? Um, I don't think it's going to take very long at all. Um, this last year particularly accelerated online shopping and online food shopping like nothing ever before. So, um, so I, uh, urban people aren't going back to shopping in person if they don't have to. And I think one of the things the pandemic showed us, even in New Zealand, is I could get avocados as a service, I got cheese as a service. Um, we get meat delivered on a regular basis now. Um, I don't go into my butcher anymore and, and so on. You know, I really only go now into the butcher for a specialist cut. Um, but all of that can be delivered and um, easily and at a low price. So I think you also saw that we all ended up at Zoom parties. Um, I went to a great Meet Women event where we got couriered some meat and then um, we ate it together. Uh, and it was a fantastic event. So we're seeing more of the social, um, social thing. We're also seeing that everything is going subscription and I'm just not gonna get through my whole slide deck, but what we're seeing more and more is that people are doing these long-term um, long-term subscription deals mm -hmm. and um, one of the biggest implications that I think it has for you is that over time people like John Deere have been saying now for six years that they don't want to sell equipment they just want to do it on a subscription and I think this has some big implications for our balance sheets particularly our farm lending down in the future um, so I just want you to keep that in the back of your minds so Here's John Deere and where they're going. Um, the bottom right, I think, is hilarious at the moment. It is their first electric um, tractor. It's got a kilometer long electric cord. Um, but as I watch these signals, what I can see is that it won't be long before they have those um, figured out with solar. And so I'm predicting fairly soon that John Deere will ditch the combustion engine and be able to replace that with a fully solar machine. Um, you know, I don't like the idea of being able to run this cord over, but they're definitely doing it. Somebody's asked me, what's my opinion on meat generated in factories? Um, Lab-generated meat, will that have an, a, a significant effect on the ag industry? 
Um, I think that there will be quite a lot of lab grown meat. Um, and I think that that lab grown meat will be aimed at that transactional bottom of the market end that I was talking about. Um, so at the moment, what they're talking about is aiming it at the people who don't get to choose their food. So we're talking about prisons, old people's homes, schools, hospitals. That's where that lab grown meat will go. Um, that high end meat that is a treat is where I think we need to be thinking about meat. And I say this in particular around when you think about we've um, halved the number of animals in New Zealand, but we've still increased the yield and we've increased profit off that. What we need to be thinking about is how do I get the most per kilo for my meat? And how do I use every single piece of that animal if we're going to take its life? And that's true whether it's in the lamb or the beef sector. There is going to be a lot more disruption in dairy than there is in meat. And part of that is that dairy is so focused on the ingredients market that the ability to create whey, for example, in a digesture is getting closer and closer. And to be able to do that at a commercial scale, which is cheaper than producing it through a cow, is coming at us quite quickly. The other area that we're seeing major disruption, I believe, coming is that the ability to, um, in a factory, be able to create bio-identical breast milk is getting very close. And we're seeing two um, very interesting startups, one out of Israel and one out of Singapore, who are both doing this. One of them, you can take your own breast milk in and they'll scale that up and make formula out of it for your child specifically. Um, so they're doing it at the personal level. And the other one, what they're doing is they're doing it at a mass scale, just a kind of a, a bioidentical universal breast milk. Um, so I, I think that the formula business is in way more trouble than the meat business. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, I think there's a question here about what if our land is taken over by carbon farming and then what? Um, I believe that the farm of the future is going to have multiple income streams. Um, farming is definitely going to have some carbon aspects to it in terms of revenue. There may also be some local tourism uh, and we'll see a mixture of whatever is appropriate for your land. Um, I, I think this is true of many businesses is that we're going to see a diversification of revenue streams. So I'm um, with Andrew when he talked before about an optimist. I'm extremely hopeful, particularly about the meat industry. Um, and I, but I do think that we may see that the revenue mix changes in terms of what revenue there is on farm. And we can again look at to the other countries and see that people like Denmark, who made a major change from being about dairy, um, they now their farmers get multiple revenue streams, including energy production because of the wind power that they have. And they're also doing a lot of carbon farming. So I, I think we'll see these diversified um, diversified income in the future. A couple of other signals that I'm seeing is quite a lot globally around glyphosate. And I think this is a sleeper issue for us. Um, and again, I'm not here to comment on your glyphosate use or not. What I'm saying is that we're seeing signals from the market for higher prices for glyphosate free products. And we're also perhaps seeing a few signals like from Japan um, saying that they won't take our products if, um, if they're too high in glyphosate. And I think this is a sleeper issue that we need to get ahead of. I know Andrew said, please, please no more environmental issues. We've got water and we've got climate. Um, but I, I do believe that both glyphosate and cadmium are uh, issues that we need to be keeping an eye on and, and get ahead of. I uh, saw a couple of questions for Andrew around regen. Um, what we're seeing in terms of regen is um, we're seeing an opportunity for people who do want to do it to get much higher prices in market. And um, I don't want to tell any of you that you should or shouldn't do this. This is not my opinion. My opinion is that um, the market will segment itself, that people who want to do this and get their higher prices from that will do it. For other people, they'll find that it's appropriate to get um, profit from volume. And um, but we are seeing, you know, particularly a year like this where it was heartbreaking to send pelts to um, to compost. We're hoping to see an increase in high prices for specific kinds of leather, and particularly regen leather is starting to have its moment. Who knows? I don't have a, a an opinion on the future yet, but I'm I'm watching this space quite hard. Um, the other one that we're seeing is we're seeing modern slavery is becoming a social license issue, um, whether it's around the, the commentary that's gone on around our phosphate use or what we're also seeing is child slavery cases coming up around the world. 
Um, and I just think it's an area that we need to keep a good eye on. Um, so our social license is not just what happens in New Zealand, our social license is also in our supply chains. And the very last thing I want to leave you with is, is climate change, climate change, climate change. Um, I think that, you know, we, we have to be keeping an eye on climate change. I'm very proud of the work that Beef and Lamb has been doing on climate change. Um, we were well ahead of the Climate Commission, well ahead of, of the Ministry for the Environment and others. Um, I think you can be incredibly proud of what Beef and Lamb is doing and the position that it's taking and the science-led approach. Uh, but we can't ignore climate change and the difference it's going to make. So I believe this, that you can't fight the existing reality. What you can do is you can build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Um, I have great faith in the meat industry. I think it's got a very um, strong future. I do believe that there'll be a rise in veganism and I do believe that there'll be a rise in alternate meats. Uh, at the same time, I believe that there's a real opportunity for us to do what I call artisan production at scale. So very caring, cared for, high animal welfare product um, will be able to uh, get the best prices in market. And ultimately, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to see you as farmers get the best prices and get the best profit into your farms. And over time, we know that that's going to be through a higher value product rather than a higher volume one. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your great questions. Um, I've got a couple more here, if I'm allowed, um, which is around common definitions around regen ag. Um, I, I do and don't think it's a problem. I think what happens in any emerging field is that it takes a while to settle down. I'm very interested to watch the customer rather than the farmer make this definition. And the reason for that is that I want to link it to your income. And so I, I think that working in partnership with people like Whole Foods or Aldi or who or the big Chinese um, distributors, working with them to find a definition that meets their customer need is going to be the best way to define Regen Ag. And I know we're all going to want to have an input into it, and I agree with that, but I think if farmers define it, it's actually not going to get you um, necessarily the value that you're looking for. Um, no, that's controversial. Um, I love this one. Uh, thanks, Harv. How does the meat sector break out of the system where the processes are dominated by old white men? Well, the good news is they're going to die off eventually. Uh, there's a lot of us coming through. If I look at things like meat women, um, there are thousands of members now globally of the meat women um, organization. Uh, Leanne, who's going to talk as part of that community as well. And um, I think that you, know, you shouldn't knock some of the old white guys. There's a bunch of them who have done incredible pioneering in this industry and I look at um, the founders of you know I, I have huge admiration people like Tony Egan, Craig Hicks and um, you know Gerard at First Light there are a bunch of these white guys who are pushing the envelope and who are doing really great stuff and my apologies if I didn't name you and you're doing awesome things because there are a lot of you out there um, but the intergenerational change is coming and it's coming at a customer-led level rather than a producer-led one I think. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you want to throw that over to the floor. Or oh, here's one last one. What do you think farms could be doing better to maximise their opportunities in a quickly changing environment? Um, I do believe understanding the, um, the market is one of the most important things, understanding what the market wants. And this is part of why I think it's also really important that beef and lamb does its work in market so that it can get the messages from the market back to you as producers as quickly as possible and you can adapt in a way that will get you the better prices. Cool. Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, You're welcome. Thought provoking as always, um, a beautiful way to set the scene really for for what today is all about. So, um, yeah, thank right. you, thank you for taking the time, thank you for the technology for working. That's always uh, makes my heart start to slow down now. Um, <laughs> I have to say that Napier Port um, I actually came and they brought they got a special Wi-Fi unit off one of their ships and brought it in so that it would work perfectly. So a big thumbs up to Napier Port. Perfect. But thank you. Have a great day. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. We'll just put our hands together for Melissa. Thank you.